Wow. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Um, I'm not identifying and quantifying mar market potential. That's not my slides. How about prevention and treatment of PNALD? There we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, in this group, uh, the important thing to understand in my research is that uh, it's, it's not so much that omega-3 fatty acids are so good. They are good. It's just the omega-6 and soybean oil and things like that are so bad. So it makes omega-3 fatty acids look even better. So uh, disclosures, patent applications for use of a megavan. Uh, I haven't received any money for this. And I'll discuss unapproved uh, treatments. The funding is from the FDA, March of Dimes, Boston Children's Hospital. And I'll talk about uh, parental nutrition and short bowel syndrome. Now, parental nutrition associated liver disease is a, a, a common problem in children. This is a child who is yellow and uh, has liver disease. This was a child sent to me from England who uh, was sent home, was, was told that their child was going to have to die because would need a five organ uh, transplant. And they, uh, of course, are conserving organs and want to save five children instead of one child. And we'll talk about this disease more in a moment. Is this the right set of slides? OK. Anyway, well, regardless. So prononutrition is nutrition given intravenously. And it's given in two types. One is uh, uh, um, the fat, which is soybean oil, which is available in the United States. And the other bag contains everything else you need, the glucose, the amino acids, and trace elements. The types of fatty acids that we give intravenously are one, as I mentioned, soybean oil. As you mentioned, see they're intralipid, has linoleic acid, alpha linoleic acid, and also has a lot of phytosterols, which you see at the bottom. Omegavan contains uh, EPA and DHA, mostly very little linoleic acid, and it doesn't contain any phytosterols. Now, 40 to 60,000 patients a year are, on, are dependent on parental nutrition. At Children's Hospital, at any given day, we have 60 patients who are on it. And I have 40 patients of my own that are on it at home. It's life-saving, but it has complications. The patients develop infections, metabolic abnormalities, and of course, PN-associated liver disease. What happens to these patients if their disease doesn't per, uh, reverse? Then they develop cirrhosis liver failure, they go on to liver transplant, then die or just die. And so the main treatment for these patients up until recently was the treatment uh, by giving, getting these patients to full feeds. But these children can't eat, so we can't put them on full enteral feeds. So what are the risk factors? Well, prematurity. So the youngest children are, are the most at risk. Young age, low birth weight, several, line infections, sepsis, uh, if a patient's on parental nutrition for a long period of time, they will likely develop this disease. Shortcut syndrome, which I'll talk about in more detail. Multiple operative procedures. And as a surgeon, when I give lectures, uh, especially to medical people or pediatricians and neonatologists, is I tell them to keep the surgeon away from the patient. And of course, the absence of ventral feeds is a problem. So short bowel syndrome, well, there's several definitions. But basically, if a patient requires parental nutrition for two or more months, then it's uh, short bowel syndrome. 
and over 40 to 60 percent of patients, and at our hospital about 50 percent of patients develop cholestasis, which is the jaundice, and it's defined as a bilirubin greater than, direct bilirubin greater than two, or other people use the term conjugated bilirubin. This is a recent study, it just came out in the Journal of Pediatrics recently, which included Children's Hospital, Cincinnati Children's, uh, UCLA, Seattle, all the ma so several of the major children's hospitals in the United States. And we started the use of fish oil intravenously at the end of 2004, but this is the data from look, looking at all the patients together at the 14 institutions. And this is just a patient who requires a child under a year of age requiring PN for greater than two months. The mortality is 27%. The transplant rate was 26%. So basically, a mortality and transplant, which is the same thing as a mortality, is about 53%. 47% went weaned from parental nutrition. So you see the, the patients who did okay were the ones who ultimately weaned from the nutrition we give intravenously. Well, what about at Boston Children's Hospital? Well, uh, from the early 90s to the late 90s, we looked at our data and the mortality for a patient with cholestasis was 38%. But people said, well, you need to look at a later cohort, look at it 2000 to 2004 and see what the mortality was was 37.5%, so it really didn't make any difference. At the, if you look at the University of Michigan, just three months with an elevated bilirubin, 78%. Toronto sick kids, if you have cholestasis for greater than a year, 90% of the patients died because one out of the 10 patients had a transplant. They haven't had any deaths or transplants from what I understand since 2006, since taken on our protocol. And the take home slide is that 1.4% of all deaths of children four and under are related to this disease. So the treatment, treatment is people do many things, but there's really not much you can do other than reduce the fats, which I've shown that doesn't make that much difference, cycling PN, giving people a break from the high glucose load. Uh, maybe feeding a little bit, full feeds are curative. So the ideal lipid emulsion, which does not exist, would uh, reverse or prevent essential fatty acid deficiency not produce hepatic steatosis and prevent elevation of liver enzymes. Now, I'm only, all this work I did clinically is based on laboratory work, but I'm limited it to two slides on the laboratory. If you take animals and you feed them chow, or one group you just feed them parental nutrition without the lipids, if you give the lipids orally versus the lipids intravenously and use different lipids, either um, uh, clenolaic, SMOF, intralipid, you sacrifice the animals at 19 days and you look at their livers histologically. And this is the only animal slide I have for you. But if you look at the upper left hand, you see that chow, this is all red O staining, has almost no fat. Or in, and also if you look at the bottom right, the omega Ven one looks good. But if you look at PN plus intralipid in the top right, which is the standard we give all our patients in the United States, it's pretty ugly, that's fat. If you look at clenolaic acid, which I think just got approved in Canada, it doesn't look any better. And PN plus SMOF, which has a little bit of fish oil, looks intermediate. So let's talk about clinical experience. So uh, the issue, I didn't really want to take this to patients immediately, but we had so many patients dying and I was requested to try treating these patients since the mortality is so high. And Omegavin is a fish oil-based lipid emulsion. It's typically used with intralipid in Europe at 20% of the fat calories. Um, the max dose is 0.2 grams per kilo per day. We use five times the dose. It's not indicated for use in children. It's contraindicated in children. We only use it in children. It's uh, not intended to be used alone. We use it alone. It's not FDA approved, but the FDA lets us use it. <laughs> you gotta do something when something's fatal and there's been no advances in, you know, 40 years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the safety and efficacy of this. So what we did is open label. So originally, the, the nice thing to do would be a prospective randomized control trial. First of all, we had no money, no intention to do in a trial, and we had patients who were dying in front of us. So the idea was give it to the patients. And any patient you talk to, the first 30 patients I treated, I tried to talk them out of it, but they all wanted it. And the first patient said to me, if this works because we have no choice because our child's liver is failing. I want you to make it available to anyone who needs it. And I have to, Children's Hospital has done that and they spend $100,000 every two weeks providing 
uh, a mega event for people across the country. But anyway, it's 49 infants with short bowel syndrome who are the initial cohort, and they all had to have a bilirubin of greater than two. And patients had to have the PNALD, they had to have a direct bilirubin, must have failed other therapies, but you don't have much time in these children. Just even a month will increase the mortality of not treating them appropriately and you have to exclude other causes of liver disease. We lift out cystic fibrosis initially, but we've had patients with PNALD and cystic fibrosis, and their disease is reversed, so we don't exclude them anymore. And the historical inclusion group, which is a group from 2000, 2004, just before we started using, actually 2005, just before we started using the omega event, and they had to have the same criteria. The problem is, is that the omega event group were much sicker because what hospitals were doing from across the country, or families were doing, is the children were dying on their deathbed, bleeding out, bleeding from their eyes, their guts, everything. And we, I included everybody because I didn't want to try to make my numbers look better. I felt it was a compassionate trial. So what we did is we stopped their intralipid, put them on omega Ven, which was a lower dose than the lipid they were on, and additional calories were given as carbohydrates, which is dextrose. And so if you look at the two groups, you have the omega event and the soybean group. We, if you look at comparisons, the ages were similar, birth weight were similar, gestational age were similar, and duration of PN in the last portion was that patients were on it for a longer period of time with the omega event patients, so two months versus one month. And the importance of that is the longer you're on TPN, the worse your liver injury is. So everything we did was play against ourselves in these studies, because one, I didn't want to do it, uh, uh, but uh, two is if you're going to sh use something clinically, I thought it would be best to play against yourself. Now, if you look at the p-values on the right there, you can see that the bilirubins were higher in the omega Ven group. You can look at the total bilirubins were higher. And if you look at the ALT, which is a measure of liver injury, was elevated in the omega Ven group, but normal in the soybean group. The albumin levels were actually surprisingly a little better in the soybean group, which is an important marker. In the bottom column, you can also see that uh, the INR, which is a measure of coagulations, was similar. Platelet counts, if you, platelets are a very important measure of disease and liver disease. As the liver gets congested, the spleen gets enlarged, and the platelet counts drop. So the soybean group actually had normal um, uh, platelet counts, but the Megaven once had low platelet counts, as a significant, which is significant for much worse liver disease. And the ultimate outcome was that if you have death and transplant just in this cohort, where, which was weighted heavily against the omega Ven group, the difference was 0 0.007. So if a patient was also going to reverse on omega Ven, it only took them 81 days in this cohort. But if anyone improved on intralipid, it took 492 days. But very few of them re reversed at all. Most of them went on to die. If you look on the left, if you look at the omega Ven group, the column, the uh, up and down column is where we started the omega Ven. The bilirubin, the black bar is the median bilirubin level. As you can see that those patients, the bilirubins went down. Almost everyone went to normal. But if you look at the um, historical control group, uh, the bilirubins continued to go up and patients fell out as they died or went on to transplants. To look at it another way, these are all the patients put together. The blue shows that the, the is, this is the bilirubin level, and you can see the p-values are there. The bilirubin in the interlipid or soybean group was lower and then went elevated, and the omega Ven group went down. If you look at the probability of re reversing cholestasis, what the oncologists love, something like this, but uh, the uh, omega Ven group, almost everyone reversed, while the patients who remained on interlipid did not. The ALT levels were lower in the soybean group, which is in blue, but then elevated while in the omega Ven group dropped, which is the measure of liver injury. And if you look at the triglycerides, as you might expect, the triglyceride levels always bottom out in the omega Ven group. I mean, it's sometimes almost unmeasurable. The, but when the triglycerides drop is when the bilirubin gets better, so those go hand in hand. Albumin levels went on in the soybean group, went on down, which is also significant as their liver failed and went on to die. 
uh, platelet counts. Well, it's interesting that the platelet counts started lower in the omega Venn group, but at the end were higher. And if you can see in the soybean group, which is the lower with the round uh, circles, uh, those patients went on to drop their platelets. And one important point, which is a several hour lecture, is the tri and tetrienolate ratio. Fish oil has arachidonic acid and DHA. The body tries to make arachidonic and DHA. If you give arachidonic acid and DHA alone, that's plenty to prevent biochemical essential fatty acid. The animals reproduce fine, they grow fine. I took them all the way up to seven generations with only DHA and arachidonic acid. So the big, and also all of our patients who are completely dependent on this uh, with just fish oil, none of them develop essential fatty acid deficiency. The growth is fine also, as mentioned. If you look at infection rate, we of course had trouble with our IRB because they say, well, omega-3s are immunosuppressive, and uh, which we saw here, if you could see the p-values at the bottom on the right, that the number of infections decreased significantly. And this may be just because they didn't go on to die of liver failure and because most of those patients die of sepsis or bleeding. And no one developed essential fatty acid deficiency, as I mentioned. So we presented this data to the FDA, and originally the FDA was interested in looking at our uh, numbers, and also they wanted another major institution to corroborate exactly our data. And so we gave it to them, and they said, well, uh, they're, not par they're not matched well enough, meaning the omega van group's too sick, so how do we know, you know, anyway. So what uh, the company just did uh, was they actually hired someone to do the statistics on pair matching patients. I told the FDA that that's a mistake to do pair matching because it's going to make the Omegavan look really too good. You're just not going to see any problems whatsoever. But they wanted it, and this is the data. This is just fresh data I'm going to show you. So they tried to match things as best they could because still the Omegavan group was sicker. They matched age, direct bilirubin, and gestational age. And this is the resolution of cholestasis on the uh, Omegavan group on the left side. Uh, 30 of 31 patients reversed the cholestasis, and 52% or 48% did not. They went on to transplant and died. So that's kind of consistent with what I, what I already show, showed you. And the bilirubin's got better over a quicker time. But then the mortality, which is a, a solid line, everyone knows when someone's dead, that we had no mortality in the Omegavan group and then there was a 19% uh, a mortality in the, just the historical control group. And this is the data that is still published nowadays from patients who are not using the Megavan, such as Cincinnati Children's, which is now, and Morgan Stanley published the data. They still have a 38% mortality, which we don't want to ever go back to again. And what's interesting now is that as a surgeon, if you look at this, this is uh, intestinal length. So you can see that patients as little as 10 centimeters of bowel, if their liver isn't destroyed, will come off TPN ultimately. So babies up to almost 40 centimeters of bowel when I was training, which it wasn't that long ago, basically said, let them die. They're going you know, to die of liver disease and transplant. But if you can see here, almost everyone is able to wean off parental nutrition as long as you protect their liver and let them grow. So these are some of the first children. This is the first children at a, a child in Canada to get the Omega vent. She's actually off TPM now and doing well. Some patients are overfed, which you shouldn't do, but this child was uh, uh, told to go, a mom was told to take the child home, not name her and let her die, but she's off TPM now and doing well. This is the little girl I showed you in the first picture, and uh, she's actually doing very well. She's still on parental nutrition. When she first came to us, as you know, the liver is very important for glucose um, homeostasis, and you're just turning down her TPN rate just a little bit, she'd just go off to sleep because her blood sugar went down. She can go 24, 48 hours without anything, and her liver's functioning fine. And these children do grow well. If you see the dots be below the bar, uh, graph, that's when she came here. And actually, if you update this, she's at the 95th percentile. And almost all her calories are from parental nutrition and her sources of fat based on her fatty acid profiles and by the amount that she eats is all, is, uh, all fish oil. Some of these children, as they're weaning, they're growing and they are, have backpacks on. Uh, and when they start walking, they 
tip over, as you might imagine, but they, they get their center of gravity. And then ultimately, like I mentioned, most of these children come off. And we do treat very young babies, too. It doesn't matter how young they are. That's the end of my talk. Thank you.